the bones, I wanted to remind you that when we grow up anatomically, our skull bones are not connected completely. They actually, remember, it's intermembranous ossification. So they start from the membranes made of connective tissue and then they start to ossify. So in the fetal skull, you're going to find the um, frontal bones, the parietal, the occipital, and the temporal. Sorry, it's still recording though, so you're fine. Um, it's going to be on the cast, okay? So let's go over it again. The frontal, the occipital, the parietal, and the temporal. But they are more separated than in the adult skull. And the structures that separate them are called fontanelles. The anterior fontanelle, the mastoid fontanelle, and the posterior fontanelle. So essentially, <clears throat> as we discussed, this allows a baby, bra a baby skull to um, reversibly deform when baby is going through the birth canals. Make sense? That's why often um, when children start to crawl around and they start to fall and they hit their head, it isn't as dangerous as in, in, in adults because they, their skulls can absorb more shock from, from the heat than adult skull. So it, is, it turns out to be less dangerous on their they brains. Uh, one of the malformations, question? Um, completely, five, six, it depends on some children, it can be later, um, five, six, seven, eight, but not, by the age, pretty much by the middle school, it's, it's all ossified, okay. Um, now, another malformation that's pretty common is cleft palate, it's, um, when two halves of the maxilla do not fuse, you can see it right here, the, this formation, it's fairly easily treated surgically. The, some estimations suggest that the surgery itself, without, how to say, like if you don't have to pay uh, abnormal salary to a surgeon, like if, if it's not thousand dollars an hour doctor surgery itself can be as cheap as thirty five dollars okay if of course if it's done on a massive scale so when we talk about clinic that can do cleft plate surgeries and then anti cost of antibiotics anesthesia surgical equipment it all comes up to as low as 35 bucks if it's done Properly, okay, with proper logistics and everything. So it's it's uh, it's available, okay, and it's very underserved, I would say, in developing countries. Huh? Uh, the actual procedure, I wouldn't be able. I I don't really know. I I believe they somehow they probably use some feeling to. Uh, to fuse, or they may be restored cosmetically here, okay, so that the leap looks normal, okay. Oh yeah, here it's, it's, the surgery itself is pretty common, it's nothing, nothing unheard of. Interesting aspect that, we, we talked about uh, it a little, interesting aspect of skeletal growth is that different parts of the skeleton grow differently. Actually, the shape of the newborn head and adult head are somewhat different because of the fontanelles, because um, of the spaces that exist between the bones. Another interesting thing is that uh, head, the skull, grows slower than the rest of the skeleton. You would look at the proportions of the head to the rest of the body, it turns out that head becomes smaller and smaller portion of the whole body. I think it's, you know, it's quite interesting. Probably also implies that uh, the size of the brain 
doesn't increase as much as the size of other organs, and that's actually true. So proportions in kids and adults is very, very different. Uh, when babies develop, they actually develop different curvatures. So remember we talked about four different curvatures that can be found in, uh, in adults. We have cervical curvature, thoracic. So we have, if this is a head, if this is the head, and this are the legs, and this are the arms, then we have cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral curvature. Okay? So your vertebral column is not straight. So in children, you have only thoracic and sacral. So you can see the thoracic here and sacral, that what gives babies back a C shape. And they develop secondary curvatures, the cervical and the lumbar here. They, that's pretty much at the time when they can lift their heads. So they start to develop enough strength in the muscles that allow them to hold their head. And that actually promotes the development of those curvatures. It kind of plugs into the discussion that we had on Monday. What keeps you, what keeps your back straight? Muscles, right. So strength of the muscles will allow the proper posture. Um, as we become older, we become shorter. Because the intervertebral discs become less hydrated, they shrink, and we can lose actually like three, four, five, couple of inches by the, by the, when, when we reach old age in terms of height. Um, and also, the curvatures change. Now, dehydration of the discs means that they become less elastic and less resilient to the compression, which means that they can develop hernia more easily. And it is actually observed that in older people, herniation of the disc is more frequent. And as we already discussed, the bone mass decreases. And you can see, uh, we're not so much interested in the absolute mass, but more in the relative you know, relative decrease. And in both men and women, you know, up to a certain point, the decrease happens fairly in a similar pattern. But then in, in females, around the time, common time for the menopause, the um, regression of the bone mass becomes faster and faster. And as I mentioned, the only way to slow down that process, effective women, I mean, is the strength, the resistance exercise. Hormonal, we, we discussed the effects of hormonal replacement therapy. There are so many side effects that it actually is kind of bad. Okay, does that make sense? And also when, when, you, um, when you do resistance training, you actually increase that bone mass. So imagine having that big bone mass. So have more bones to lose. Okay, so they they stronger in the beginning, <clears throat> so you still resistant to fractures, although you you inevitably going to lose some some bone mass. Next topic we're going to chat about is joints, and when we say a word joint, we refer to the place where two bones actually articulate like this, okay? So when we think about joints, we think about mobile, and that's one of the functions, okay? The mobility of the skeleton. You know the mobile joints, like the knee joint or elbow joint. But not only this, there are many joints that actually immobile and hold different bones together. Bones of the skull, are held together by different joints. Your ribs and your sternum form the joint that hold them together. And before we talk about 
the physiology, the, the structure of the joint, the diseases of the joint, and anatomy of the joints, we need to know how to classify them. There are two ways of classification, the functional and the structural. Functional implies whether they are movable or not. Structural, how joint looks like. The functional classification implies the different degree of mobility. Joints can be completely immovable, and in this case, they are called seen arthrosis. Anything arthros, arthro, means about joint. Can you give me an example of immovable joint? Yep, yep. Joints between the, the cranial bones. They are immovable. Okay? The joint that is slightly movable, just a little bit, is called amphiarthrosis. Any idea of the slightly movable joint? Huh? Jaw? If it's slightly, I don't know what should be freely. Intervertebral discs, joints between the sternum and the ribs, they expand when you inhale. Okay? A joints between the radius, joint between the radius and ulna. They move a little bit, you know, slightly movable. And finally, diarthrosis, freely movable joints. I don't think any additional examples are necessary. All the, all, everything that we refer to as joints in our everyday life is freely movable joint. That make sense? Structural classification is a little different. So, according to the structural classification, joints can be fibers when bones are connected to each other by the connective tissue. Can be cartilaginous when joints are connected to each other by cartilage. It can be synovial, which in my opinion can be easily described when two joints are dipped in the socket with a fluid in it. It's more complex than that, and we'll talk about the actual structure of the synovial joint. But important is that synovial joint is filled with fluid, which actually enables the easy and free movement of the joint. The fibrous joints, um, divided in three subcategories, sutures, syndesmosis, and gomphosis. Um, that distinction is based on the length of the connective tissue fibers that link two bones together. These joints do not have a joint cavity. Your elbow does have a joint cavity. Your knee does have a joint cavity. These do not have a joint cavity. First example is a suture. It's a joint you, you already know them. The coronal suture, the sagittal suture, the squamous suture, the lambdoid suture. Sutures can be found only in the skull. I have it here. Only in a skull, okay? So they are fairly expandable in the youth. So the brain can grow. But eventually in the, in the age, like middle age, the connective tissue fibers, you can see them in the bluish hue right here, start to ossify. Okay, they, they are turned into a bone, substituted by the bone. And in this, after that, these joints are called synostosis. Syndesmosis are either not immovable or slightly movable joints between, for example, tibia and fibula, the distal end, right? Immovable, so that's, there's very little movement here. The more movable joint that is still a syndesmosis is between the radius and ulna. 
So if you, uh, I can't reach Patrick, so I'm going to take it off for a second. So if you look at Patrick's arm, you can see the movement of radius and ulna. So you can see radius here and ulna here and how they move. You have to remember, we don't have it on Patrick, but these two bones, that's the anatomical position here, these two bones right here have interosseous membrane. That makes sense? Okay, so that's that's going to be another syndesmosis. You have a connective tissue membrane between two bones, and it's fairly movable. Okay. Gymphosis is the unique joint. It is the joint that is formed between the alveolar process. You can see right here the the bone part, alveolar process of the mandible or maxilla, the jaw bones, and the tooth. So this ligament, called periodontal ligament, is what holds your tooth in the maxillary process. Sorry, in, in the alveolar process, sorry, in the alveolar process. You see? So that's a unique joint. You have exact, well, if you're lucky, you have 32 of them. Okay. You lose the tooth, you lose the joint. Now, cartilaginous joints. Um, two types, synchondrosis and symphysis. So they're usually not movable or just a little bit movable, and they don't have a joint cavity as others. And among them, there are two subtypes. Synchondrosis, where there you have a plate of hyaline cartilage between the bones. Interestingly enough, the epiphyseal plate, remember what it is? It's a structure in the epiphysis here. The epiphysis of the long joint, long bone. For example, right here, the epiphyseal plate. It's a structure in the epiphysis of the bone that allows bone to grow interstitially, to grow in land. Okay. It is a temporary joint because you have a plate of the cartilage between two parts. Another example of synchondrosis is the joint between the ribs and the sternum. Slightly movable due to the expansion. Of, of the ch you, you can expand the chest, they stretch the cartilage. And different, different cartilages will have different degree of expansion. The first joint here is no expansion. As you go down, the ability of the cartilage to stretch actually increases. Okay? Symphysis is specifically where you have a fibrocartilage between two bones. And as you remember, we have fibrocartilage is two major locations. Anyone remembers? Well, actually on the slide. So it's pubic symphysis right here, right? It's a pubic symphysis and it's a vertebral cartilage. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Question? Huh? Uh, no. Good question. We have fibrocartilage there. We have fibrocartilage. But it's a component of more complex synovial joint. Okay. So knee is the synovial joint. We do have meniscus, which is fibrocartilage, but it's not the thing that defines the
the joint structure. Okay. So, synovial joints. All of the synovial joints are diatrotic, freely movable. If you think about any, that most of the joints in the body are actually diatrotic. Joints between the finger phalanges, between metacarpals and proximal phalanx. Wrist, elbow, shoulder, hip, knee, ankle. All those joints, TMJ, all those joints are diatrotic. The basic idea of synovial joint is that it is filled with a fluid and this fluid is in so-called synovial cavity. The major elements of the synovial joint include the articular cartilage, first of all. So ends of the bone. Huh? Sorry about that. So remind me, remind me right away. I'm really forgetful about this. Um, so articular cartilage here. Okay. It protects the ends of the bone from rubbing against each other. You know, like in um, different parts, like uh, associated with friction in the machines, they sometimes covered with Teflon or some other polymers to decrease the friction. Same happens here. There's a less rubbing, less damage. The cavity. Each synovial joint has a cavity, you see? This cavity is filled with the synovial fluid. To kind of form the cavity, the joint is going to have a capsule so-called articular capsule. The articular capsule consists of the fibrous layer and the synovial membrane. Now what is synovial membrane? You can guess that synovial membrane produces synovial fluid. Does that make sense? So synovial fluid as any, pretty much any other internally produced fluid in the body, is a filtrate of plasma without, practically without blood cells, okay? It's slippery, it's viscous, and it provides lubrication to the cartilage. Since it comes from the, from the blood by the filtration, it also contains nutrients and oxygen, which are supplied to the cartilage covering the ends of the bone. One important feature of the synovial fluid is that there are phagocytes in it. Think about the ends of the bone that articulate with each other, like elbow, the ulna, and the humerus. They constantly rub against each other, so there's going to there's constantly going to be debris, just because of that friction. Those phagocytes consume the debris. Phagocytose those fragments, and keep pretty much keep the joint, keep the joint clean. There are ligaments that reinforce joint, and we we'll talk about um, physiological importance. Of those ligaments so essentially these ligaments can be a part of the capsule like on this illustration okay they can be extra capsular like on this knee joint this is extra capsular ligament okay that's the patellar ligament it's extra capsular or they can exist inside the capsule like ACL and uh, BCL, two ligaments in the knee. You see, they are here inside of the knee joint. Make sense so far? They either are elements of the capsular wall, like here, outside of the capsule, or inside of the capsule. 
And finally, <clears throat> nerves and blood vessels. If you ever sprained a knee or shoulder, you know that it hurts. Nerves. You have a lot of receptors. They're nociceptors, kinesthetic receptors that allow you to allow your uh, somatosensory cortex to understand the joint position in space. And you also have a blood supply to the cartilage, to the synovial membrane. And, well, if we consider bone being a part of it, then to the bone. Although, <clears throat> let me ask you something. The good, decent sprain of a joint, does it heal quickly? Why doesn't it heal quickly? The first thing that doctor will tell you if you go to the doctor with a sprained ligament. It'll take a while, doctor will tell you. Why? Because of fairly poor blood supply. Poor not in terms that, like, you know, you're sick and you have just horrible blood flow. No. Vascularization of ligaments, number of blood vessels and ligaments is low. So there's not enough... Um, growth factors go in there. It's just, they will recover, but it will be slow. Okay? That's why it really takes a while for the ligaments to heal, for example. What else can you... So, those things you're going to find in pretty much all joints. Other things you may or may not find there. <clears throat> Sorry, fatty pads. You can see the, the fat pad right here. It cushions the joint. Okay, cushions the synovial membrane. Menisci, unique structure for the knee. I can't remove this, but... So this is where menisci is. Between the distal end, <clears throat> sorry, distal end of uh, femur and proximal end of fibula, uh, tibia, sorry. You see? Make sense? So it's a fibrocartilaginous structure which allows the bones to have a better grip on each other. Look at the at the knee right here. I mean they don't really match surface wise. Does that make sense? So kind of have two articulating faucets going like this. Here, you have somewhat of a cast that repeats the condyles of the femur in shape, allowing them to fit better, making joint more stable. Bursae. That's an interesting structure right here. Here. Bursae is a bag formed of the synovial membrane filled with a synovial fluid. It protects, it prevents friction between the ligaments and the bone, okay, that are components of the joint. For example, you're going to find a lot of bursae in the shoulder joint or in the knee joint. You can see bursae here, bursae here. Does that make sense? So what, how do they work? When ligament moves against the bone, that bursae starts to rotate. You can see the arrows showing. So it's like a, it's like a bearing. Does that make sense? It's like, it's like a bearing in a friction, friction bearing. Now when you, uh, People who install like uh, internet and telephone, people that have to spend plumbers, people who have to spend a lot of time on their knees. What do they wear? Knee pads. Why? Yeah, to keep them from hurting. What hurts? Bursae. When there is a constant pressure, on the knee joint, the infrapatellar and prepatellar bursae. Let me erase it and I'll make it nicer, okay? So you see the prepatellar 
and infrapatellar bursae because of the pressure become inflamed. It, it goes away. When, <clears throat> when you stop working on your knees, it goes away. But if you constantly spend time on your knees without knee pads, the pressure causes inflammation and your knees start to hurt. So they try to avoid it by wearing cushioning knee pads. A tendon sheets is kind of a, a bursae as well here. It's kind of a long, long bursae that surrounds a ligament, preventing it from rubbing. So essentially the, the same functional meaning. Now, what makes joint stable? Don't look there. I mean, it's all true, but let's just, let's just figure it out. Shape. Does that make sense? If you would try to like do the joint like this shaped, it's not going to be stable. Definitely. This bone and this bone, they don't really feed into each other. Make sense? We're talking about synovial joints. Um, so will this be a stable joint? Not really. Knee. If you look at actually any joint in the body, they don't seem very unstable if we base our decision only on the shape. Okay? Even knee, you know, with the menisci, still seems pretty unstable. So what about ligaments? Look at the knee. Patellar, ACL, PCL, um, TCL, FCL, oblique ligament. There's so many of them. Can you dislocate your knee? Sure enough. So, ligaments hold it together, but it's not a critical factor as well. Turns out, the best stabilizing factor is the muscle. Well, not essentially the muscle per se, because we have no muscles in the joints, but tendons of the muscles that cross the joint. Now, I once had a I, I try to avoid any conversations in the internet, like on the Facebook, unless they are about kittens. Okay. But I ended up once, ended up on the Facebook page about running, long distance running. And somebody was promoting the chondroitin sulfate, you know, this food supplements that you can buy over the counter in the pharmacy. And if you will read, the big ladder claims, it says, your joints and ligaments will become stronger, joint health, and blah, blah, blah. And if you read little letters at the bottom, these claims were not supported by clinical trials, FDA-approved clinical trials, which says, says it all. Uh, if you would Google the effects of chondroitin sulfate, I mean, not just Google, but go into the, if you're interested, actually, in research literature, on the medical studies. That's the site to go. PubMed.gov. It's the uh, Public Library of Science, the National Center for Biomedical Information, and so on. So it's pretty much the peer reviewed papers about clinical trials and different stuff. And if you would go there, there is not a single convincing clinical trial that suggests any benefit in, say, a joint recovery if you take chondroitin sulfate supplements. You're not going to get poisoned, you're not going to die, you're not going to get sick. I mean, they're safe, but there's no benefit from them. The only thing that improves joint stability is the muscle strength. Okay? So, for example, strong muscles, okay? muscle tendons that surround the shoulder joint will keep it stable. So training rotator cuff muscles, okay, pectoralis, big muscles like pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi uh, that cross the shoulder joint are, is extremely, deltoid, extremely important for stabilizing it. Stability of the knee joint, 
um, you have quadriceps, you have hamstrings, okay, that will keep it stable. And it belongs to virtually every joint except for one. I can't really think of exercise uh, that will train muscles that surround your TMJ, except for like chewing really, really, really hard jerky. Okay, and it's not even strength. So muscle strength is the major stabilizing component of a joint. That makes sense? Hmm? Sure. Not, I've, I have never saw any clinical trial that would give any chondroitin, glucosamine, other joint health over-the-counter supplements, any credibility in joint health. Um, I would say growth hormone will probably work wonders, but we shouldn't, generally shouldn't take growth hormone unless prescribed by a doctor. So it's, you know. No, I don't really think, you're not going to get sick, it's not a poison, it's safe, but benefits were never supported. Now, there are six types of synovial joints based on the shape of the sur articular surfaces. The plane joint, right here, is the joints, those are the joints in between your carpals. They have non-axial movements. Now, what is axial movement? Is that an axial movement? No. Is that an axial movement? Yes. Yeah, so, movement along vertical axis, around vertical axis. Does that make sense? So, this, this joints, plane joints, they slide against each other. They don't slide against each other. Hinge joints has uniaxial movement and it's a it's an elbow joint. The pivot it's the part of the elbow joint and it allows you to pronate and supinate your arm. Okay, another example of the pivot joint, anyone? Rotation. Head, yes, that movement of the head is the pivot, right? And actually, the vertical axle, okay, is dense of the second cervical vertebrae. Condylar joint is the joint between metacarpals and phalanges. Uh, it's generally biaxial. Okay, but when you combine those axes, it can actually do the movement that is known as circumduction. We'll get to the movements. Saddle joint is a specific one between the first metacarpal and the trapezium. So it also by axial movement, you can see the saddle shaped articular surfaces. And finally, ball and socket joints. Those are elbow and hip joints. There's one joint that I never actually mentioned. Knee joint. Well, it's a complex joint because it contains patellar femoral and joints between two condyles, fairly independent joints between condyles or femur, condyles of tibia. Okay, so we can, this is the gliding joint, this can be hardly put in any of those categories. So movements of the joint are controlled by the muscles, right? That cross that cross the joint. That's important. Like um, this, the semitendinosus muscle, part of the hamstring. Okay, it has insertion at the ischial tuberosity, 
sorry, the origin of the ischial tuberosity and insertion into the tibia. So if you think about hamstring, what does it do? How do you know what muscles do? You have a muscle that you don't know the function of. How do you know what it does? You have bones that it is attached to. Say again? Okay. Exactly. You imaginary shorten it and see what happens. So if you shorten that muscle, what's going to happen? Can anyone show? I really don't want to jump on the table right now. Huh? Yeah, your, your, your knee's going to flex like this because you're going to pull up tibia, okay, and it's going to go backwards. Does that make sense? Now, just as a side note, is that a good lever here? It's awful lever. It's a very short lever. It's like trying to close the door, holding it next to the uh, to the hinges. So that your hamstring muscles are huge because they work at really disadvantage, mechanical disadvantage. Okay. So um, movements of the joints occur along transverse. For, uh, so that's sagittal, okay, and coronal planes. And based on a plane, these moves are classified as flexion, extension, adduction, or abduction. There are some other unclassified moves. So movements can be non-axial, uniaxial, biaxial, and multi-axial, okay? There's pretty much no limit for that joint movement. So, gliding, non-axial movement between the carpal uh, bones. Angular movements, as I mentioned, um, flexion, extension, abduction, subduction, abduction, adduction, sorry, um, Hyperextension, circumduction. Rotation, the best example is your head, right? So gliding, carpals, tarsals, and vertebrae. I can't bend this guy over, but if we will try to imagine what's going on with the, for example, thoracic vertebrae, the individual uh, faucets, the articulating faucets will slide against each other. Does that make sense? I will have to jump to, to the table eventually. It's just I don't want to do it right now. Flexion. Flexion is when the angle between whatever you flex and the rest of the body decreases. So this is flexion, elbow flexion. This, this is knee flexion. Okay, you can see the knee flexion right here. Okay, and opposite movement will be extension. With your shoulder, it's a little bit more complex so what you have to remember flexion and extension of the shoulder happen in a sagittal plane see so extension so this is going to be a flexion of the shoulder you see what i'm saying that's a flexion because the angle between the arm and the vertical axis decreases that's flexion when i bring it back Along the body, that's extension. This is hyperextension. So some, sometimes the joint can hyperextend, sometimes it cannot. Your shoulder can, normally. Your knee, well, it shouldn't. Okay, otherwise you're going to get injured. Does 
that make sense? Angular movements. So abduction, um, when somebody is being kidnapped, what is the synonym for kidnapping? Being abducted. So you kidnap your arm from your body. That's abduction. This movement happens in the frontal or coronal plane. You can see here the abduction outside adduction when you add your arm back to your body make sense that's adduction now what do I do now with my thumb abduct and when I bring it back to my palm I adduct it does that make sense? Circumduction. It's the movement of the uh, usually limbs, refer to it as to, to limbs mostly, which produces the cone. You see? One end of the limb is fixed, another one circles. It is not a rotation, it's a circumduction. It makes a cone. You notice the, the difference here? Makes, yes, yes, that's what you do. You can do it with your, with your arm, you can do it with your leg, okay? Rotation, <clears throat> we can rotate the head. And we can, to a little extent, you can try if you want, rotate the hip. So if you fix your leg straight, you can rotate it a little bit laterally or medially. I'm kind of moving away the moment, jumping on the table, yeah. Okay. It's pretty much going to look like that. Okay. If I hope you can see that. Or I can just switch to the camera. Okay. It's too close. Well, so my, my leg, I try to rotate it in the hip so that everything else moves along. You see, the rotation in this case is fairly limited. Okay, we have more rotation in 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 the in the neck in the cervical region. Special movements: pronation and supination. Talked about it. Supination, pronation, supination, pronation. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Let me see if yeah. So Patrick will show it to us. So plantar flexion is this way. Dorsiflexion is this way. Plantar, dorsi. Plantar, dorsi. That makes sense? Pretty much when you stand on your toes, you do plantar flexion. When you walk on your heels, you do dorsiflexion. Okay? If inversion and diversion. Um, when you walk on the outside surface, the lateral surface of the foot, okay? When you try to walk on this surface of the foot, you do the inversion, okay? You try to move the foot like inwards. When you try to walk on the medial surface, medial aspect, medial border of your foot, that's the eversion. See the difference? Uh, protraction and retraction, uh, exclusively for mandible. Yeah, so it looks like the bulldogs have constantly protracted mandible. Um, elevation and depression. 
mandible, but also your shoulders. When you shrug, you elevate your shoulders. When you do this, you depress your shoulders. Okay? Up position. That's ex movement, you know, that forms this. Allows you to touch your all your four digits with your thumb. Okay? That's up position movements. Now, to the structure of the joints. So knee joint. As I mentioned, um, it's a, a multi, it's a complex joint. So first is femora patellar, between the femur and patella right here. It's a gliding joint. Okay. See that? And you have two tibiofemoral joints. The lateral tibiofemoral and medial tibiofemoral. The joints actually involve the condyles or femur and tibia and the menisci here that allow better match in terms of shape. Question? Okay. So um, the movements, flexion and extension, if you will ask somebody, well, you can try to do it. I'm not really good at it. You, a little bit of rotation is allowed in the knee joint. Not a lot. Actually, if you will put your foot on the ground and try to do this movement, you will notice that there is a little bit of rotational flexibility in the knee joint. There are a lot of bursae, okay? Capsule is almost non-existent. Anteriorly, the ligaments form the capsule. The, the fibrous, fibrous layer is pretty much absent. So it's a patellar retinacular, patellar retinacular and patellar tendon. They actually form a very wide and broad anterior wall of the capsule. You can see that. The two retinacular and patellar ligament. Okay? On the sides, the fibular and tibial, you, these guys you can see here. So you can see tibial collateral ligament and fibular collateral ligament that additionally stabilize the joint and form the synovial capsule. And on the back, there's an oblique popliteal ligament and the arcuate popliteal ligament. You can't really see them on the model. Okay. So it's mostly, <coughs> sorry, capsular and extracapsular ligaments that form the capsule of the uh, knee joint, the actual, the actual synovial capsule. But every athlete knows two intracapsular ligaments of a knee joint, the anterior and the posterior cruciate ligament. Now I'm going to switch to the camera and show them to you on the model. So this is the knee joint, okay? And you can see the tibia and the fibula right here. Okay? This is meniscus. So far, follow me? And I removed the patellar ligament away. So if we do this, this one, is ACL, anterior cruciate ligament. You see that it is attached to the anterior aspect of the tibia and more of a medial or posterior aspect of the femur. You see? Not really? No? Sort of, kind of. Now, the PCL 
right here. It is attached to the posterior aspect of the femur and posterior aspect of the tibia, just not really inserted on this model. So those ligaments prevent this movement of the bones. You see? Well, I can move them because these ligaments on this model are not really attached and they're made of rubber so I can extend them all I want. But generally speaking, if you will try to move someone's lower leg, it's not going to go because of the ACL. Okay? Um, so they are intracapsular. You can you can see them here actually. So that's ACL, and that's here is the PCL. If you get a lateral heat in the knee, there are three C that become torn. First goes tibial collateral ligament. So in that lateral heat right here. This is what happens. This guy goes first. Okay? Next, cruciate ligaments are torn. And then, if, <laughs> if somebody continues to push on it, if it's a really hard hit, the menisci can get not completely destroyed, it's really hard to destroy fiber cartilage, but it may damage the fiber cartilage and pieces of menisci end up in the knee. So you can imagine that this type of injury allows a long time for recover, okay, um, especially if they are completely, completely torn in pieces. We'll discuss why it doesn't uh, really uh, get better without surgery. A ball and socket, that's, a, you know, the glenohumeral joint here, shoulder joint. Um, most freely moving and probably second most dislocated joint in a human body. Because if you think about it, there is um, there's a nice cavity which is not actually restricted by a lot of things. So you have uh, the acromial process, coracoid process, glenohumeral cavity, and that's it. And the head of the humerus is not very prominent. So the stability of the joint is maintained by ligaments and muscles. But we have discussed already that ligaments aren't very good at stability maintenance, and muscles, sometimes they're just weak. So um, these four ligaments mostly support the stability of the joint. The coracohumeral ligament connects coracoid process and the humerus. And then the glenohumeral ligaments form some kind of uh, a labrum. Labrum means a leap. Forms like a little cup around the head of humerus. That increases the feet, of course. Okay? But those glenohumeral ligaments are frequently absent, so the joint is, is not really stable. Muscle tendons that reinforce it, the biceps, pretty much biceps brachii, and four rotator cuff muscles. Three muscles of the scapula, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and subscapularis, and rather smaller teres minor. They stabilize the shoulder joint. Um, a nice example of shoulder joint dislocation can be seen in the third movie of um, the Lethal Weapon ser series. We ever saw Mel Gibson, or the policeman that he plays, is drowned at the end of the movie, and he's in a they call it a, a rest, huh? Rest, yeah, the restraint jacket, and he dislocates his shoulder and able to kind of get out of it. Actually, apart from 
the movies, one of the most frequent issues um, with the glenohumeral joint, when you take a child and you start to rotate it like this, that, that causes frequent dislocation. So all you have to do, though, is to bring a child that will pop it in. Okay? So it's kind of partial, partial dislocation of the joint. We were lucky. We dislocated a different joint in our kid. Actually, elbow joint. We also rotated it. Well, him. It wasn't it at the point. It was already like four years old. And we noticed that he couldn't do this. So his elbow joint was partially dislocated. So we brought him... They popped it in. He was screaming, of course. It's, actually, it's painful. But it's like seconds, if you know how to do that. So uh, the elbow joint is the uniaxial hinge joint, which is strengthened by several muscles, the biceps brachii, the triceps brachii. Uh, there is a little muscle called anconius, which is very, very small. Um, Pretty much those two muscles. Due to its not really free movement, it isn't frequently dislocated. So you can see the radial ligament, the annular ligament that surrounds the head of the radius. So it should be here. Let's see if I have. I mean, I do have elbow, but it's kind of. I'm trying to see if I can show you the no annual lig annular ligament is almost completely gone. And all the ligaments just there those are only tendons. You can see the um the triceps here that reinforces the joint, the biceps that reinforces the joint. Okay? And uh the flexors and extensors of the wrist that reinforce the joint. So those three ligaments, annular, ulnar collateral, and radial collateral ligaments, they serve some extent the stability of the joint, but it's mostly muscles. And the lack of really free movement. Let's talk about, let me see. Yeah, we're going to talk about hip joint and, and take a break. Uh, it's also a ball and socket, but it's more stable because the body weight is on the hip, right? So you can see that the cavity in which head of the femur is inserted is much deeper. Actually, one of the features, anatomical features of that cavity, so-called acetabular labrum. Essentially, it's the ridge of the connective uh, cartilaginous tissue on the edge of acetabulum that extends the cavity, like an additional structure extends the cavity <clears throat> and makes it deeper. You can see the labrum right here on that anatomical picture of the cadaver hip. You see? So the head of the humerus nicely inserts into the deeper cavity. Okay, now range of motion is still pretty decent but restricted compared to the glenohumeral joint. The major stabilizing ligaments are the smaller ligamentum teres that actually connects the pubic part of the hip bone with the head of the femur and different something femoral ligaments. So you have iliofemoral that connects iliac part with the femur, ischiofemoral which connects ischial part with the femur, and pubofemoral that connects pubic part with the femur. Shorter ligaments, they shorter and wider which provides them with additional degree of mechanical strength. And, in fact, if you think about muscles that cross the hip joint, there are so many, starting from quadriceps, going to three gluteus muscles, different obturator muscles, 
tensor fascia latte, adductor. So there's so many muscles that cross the hip joint that it becomes really, really stable. Next, we're going to talk about TMJ. I have a little story to tell you about this. But for now, 